Welcome back to this week's edition of the New Variety Art Show. I'm sure glad you're tuned in today. I'm Brad Zinn, your host, as we prepare to meet another exciting variety arts performer. You know, we've had uh, clowns, mimes, jugglers, magicians, hypnotists, psychics, belly dancers. Just about anything you can think of has been here on the show, or they will be here, including Elvis impersonators. And we hope that by giving you this opportunity to meet variety arts performers of the 90s, you'll have a little better appreciation of what it is that they do the next time you see one live and in person. You know, if you have any thoughts or comments on our show, we'd love to hear from you. And there's a phone number that you can contact us at, area code. And that's the number to call if you have a thought or a comment or a suggestion for our program. Or if you have a variety arts performance coming up, let us know and we'll try to promote it for you right here on the air. And here's somebody who's on the air every week uh, and on the keyboards as well, our musical director, Mr. Van Corriton. Thanks, Brad. I'm on the air, <laughs> not on the ground. I mean, no, you're pretty, uh, you're pretty where's stable. Where's that pencil? I want, what's the phone number again? I want the one. I want to make a comment. I enjoyed the show. Is that okay? Are you allowed to be doing it? Those are the kinds it? of things we want to hear. I like it because you've had funny people, politicians and <laughs> Well, yeah, even a few of those have been on. You know, we do get uh, to meet people live, uh, you know, at some of the shows that I live, do around yes. town. You know, well, I mean, face to face. Right. And one That's of the people that. that I ran into was an old friend, uh, Dwayne Veach, who used to work in one of the music stores mm -hmm. here in town. And he and his wife have a, a music publishing company now. And uh, maybe you remember this tune oh, yeah. by Rex Allen Jr. Right. Uh, it was uh, I Love You, Arizona. I Love You, Arizona. Right. right. And they used to use it on uh, one of those uh, local network affiliates mm -hmm. to sign off. Anyway, uh, Dwayne... He took the picture, too. Right. right? Dwayne mm -hmm. uh, took the picture. He and his wife own the uh, publishing rights mm -hmm. to this song, so sometime we'll try to find a way okay. to use this on the Good air. Uh, they came to see the Civitan Magic Show and, and, and came backstage and said hello. So we thought that was kind of neat. Anyway, we have an exciting guest today. Um, this uh, fellow's been a friend of mine for many, many, many years, and I, uh, I knew Michael from his days when he was pouring drinks behind the bar at the uh, Golden Eagle Restaurant, you know, at the top at of the, the valley. Top. N Worked Valley his National way Man. down. <laughs> <laughs> well, he made the, the ground floor, and he's now on his way back up again. Oh. He is mega successful and has fans all over the country. Believe me, Van. That they write him, too. They probably do. He's a very funny guy. He does magic and comedy at comedy clubs all over the country and has been a headliner and can be seen on network comedy shows such as Comic Strip Live and Sunday Night oh. Comics. And we're very pleased that he would take time out of his busy schedule to come and visit us here at the New Variety sure. Art Show. Right now, we uh, thought you'd like to see a little uh, a bit of Michael on on a recent appearance of his on Comic Strip Live. And when we come back, we'll meet Michael Finney live and in person. Don't go away. Thank you, thank you. No, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, real nice to be back here uh, in Los Angeles, especially here at uh, the Laugh Factory. I'm, uh, I'm originally from Woodland, California. But I've been in Phoenix now for almost 15 years, so I can tell you that going to hell doesn't frighten me at all. It's probably a dry heat. See, no matter where you go, people want to tell you Phoenix isn't that hot, it's a dry heat. No, 122 degrees, but that's a dry heat, isn't it? Yeah. And so is your oven there, butthead. I don't see you and your family picnicking in there on the 4th of July. It's so hot in Phoenix, people don't even sweat. They just burst into flame. <laughs> Whoa. Hey, what was that? Tommy. People always wonder why roadrunners are so fast. Hell, they don't have any shoes. Ah. If you were to slow down that meat, meat noise, it's ooh, ee, ow, damn, where are my shoes? <laughs> I'm starting to get recognized once in a while, you know, walking through airports and stuff. This little kid came running up to me. He goes, hey, wait a minute, stop, hold on, wait. Aren't you a wrestler? <laughs> I told him I wasn't, but I body slammed the little guy anyway. There, you know? <laughs> Just hate to walk away and disappoint someone like that. I think if I had my wishes, though, you know, I've always wanted to be a rock star. You know, just for a day, I'd like to get a really outrageous haircut. 
I can't sing real good, but that wouldn't rule out a Grammy, would it? Last night, there were Millie Vanilli fans in the audience, and they booed me. I didn't get mad. I knew it wasn't them booing me. Well, I got a few hobbies. I like to play golf. My favorite is I collect cars. My wife and I have some old cars. My favorite, we took a few years to restore them to some friends of mine. It's a 1968 Corvette Roadster. Yeah. Elephant man could get a date in this car. <laughs> I don't get to drive it anymore. I think any car is better than a Yugo. There's a pitiful car. And the owner, too. Because they're always on the side of the road or in the middle of an intersection with that trout look on their face. It's... <laughs> Yugo. You go. You go. You go. I can't go. I'm in a you go. Hey, why don't you go around me? Why don't you go buy a car with a motor, fool? Next year they're coming out with a station wagon. It's called a We Go. Guess you and your shadow get to go this time. Ever seen the commercial I know you have where the two Rolls Royces pull up next to each other and the guy says, pardon me, but do you have any gray poupon? I want to beat the hell out of that guy. <laughs> you know, if for no other reason other than the fact, if you're in a Rolls Royce, you got a lot of nerve mooch and mustard from anybody. <laughs> You ought to pull over, have your chauffeur go in the store, get your brand new jar. Don't be holding up my five o'clock traffic if you don't have no mustard in your Rolls Royce. But then it got me to thinking, you know, what if they did this with Yugos? What would a couple of Yugo owners say to each other? Pardon me, but do you have any cheese whiz? And then the window would get stuck. I also have an old 1977 Cadillac Eldorado Baritz. I bought this car because I've always wanted a boat. I had to register this as a barge. Reason being, you can be in this car, hit things, and you don't even know it. I got home last week, there was a Yugo underneath the front bumper. Yeah. I could be wrong about the car, but there was an empty can of cheese whiz on the floorboard, so hey. You make the call. I bought my wife a dog to keep her company while I'm on the road. You know, it's a Yorkshire Terrier. These are little tiny dogs. They're from Scotland, trained to kill the rats and the mice in the coal mines. So while not being very big, they're very fierce at heart and quite intelligent. At seven months old, McKeever could sit, lay down, roll over, speak, and shake hands. He is now almost two years old, and on occasion, he could fly. Usually, it's right after he has peed on my rug. <laughs> Thanks a lot, you guys. Good night. Michael Bay. Michael Finney, you've come a long way, baby, and we're sure glad... We we're sure glad you stopped by to join us. Michael Finney, my good friend. Thanks very, very much for having Thank me. Thank you. Man. I can't imagine our good fortune and uh, uh, your time schedule being able to stop by and say hello. Well, uh, I'm off for a couple of days. Now, that's very unusual for you because you travel around the country so very much. But let's find out how this got all got started for you because it's been a long time since you've had to pour drinks to make the rent. Uh, it's been a long time, yeah, but it was pouring drinks that... Uh, opened the door to magic. Uh, I was very fortunate that a day bartender did magic tricks and it was the first time I'd ever seen him. So uh, he amazed me. Now up to this point you'd never... No, really I, come, I come from a very small farming community up in Northern California. Uh, I moved to Phoenix about 15 years ago and uh, the only magician I ever remember seeing as a kid growing up was at a county fair and a guy did a, a paper tree and it just went up and up and up. And I just remember as a little kid just looking up into the clouds that what I thought this paper tree was going up into and uh, and really as a kid you're just fascinated but you never know that anything you know magic you're not going to get into it I mean you know, yeah it's entertainment at that time and it was amazing and um, so this fellow showed you some tricks behind the bar yeah this guy's name was Bob Shaw I really uh, I owe him a lot I, I mean uh, he just he, he did tricks to amuse me at the time and uh, I saw an opportunity to uh, enhance what it was I was doing as a bartender and that was being able to entertain people 
uh, ra rather than dull conversation, which usually ends up talking about somebody's problems. Uh, I, I saw an opportunity to do some magic and amaze people. And uh, up, up at the Golden Eagle at that time, a uh, very intellectual group of people are up there, obviously. Uh, uh, well, doctors, was, lawyers, yeah. judges. Uh, Bring your American Express card in your wallet in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> it was not a cheap place to go. No, and uh, so I, I did some stuff up there uh, behind the bar for these people. They seemed yeah. to like what I was doing. But now, bottom line, you also knew that it meant better tips too. Well, and sure. You were I mean, uh, for a I, I can't deny that at all. I saw an opportunity uh, to not only to entertain but also to increase my bankroll too. Yeah. Um, up there, you have a lot of people that, that do a lot of different things. So uh, if, if you made them laugh, the opportunities were uh, out there for things, other things yeah. to happen too. Yeah. Now you mentioned just a moment ago that you grew up in uh, Northern California. Yeah. Is that right? Is yeah. Woodland Hills? Is Wo that? No, Woodland California. Woodland, Woodland Hills is way south. Oh, okay. Uh, Woodland, Woodland California, California is up in the San Joaquin Valley, uh -huh. and uh, it's a great place for a kid to grow up. Yeah. Uh, now, do you have brothers and sisters? Uh, sure, I got a small. I have a small. I have a younger <laughs> brother. Uh, I have a younger brother who's now in Tucson. Uh, he's an executive chef at Tucson National, and I have a sister who's a tasting uh, wine room manager for uh, a wine company up in Napa. How about that? And your folks uh, were they involved in the wine business as well? Or? Uh, no. As a no. matter of fact, my father worked in a sugar plant all of his life. Uh, uh -huh. A land surveyor and sugar plant. My mother is a physician's transcriber. So wow. They both worked very hard. So really, you didn't have a background in show business. Uh, no. Uh, my grandmother, though, played a piano in piano bars. Uh -huh. and my grandmother was the only link to the entertainment thing. Yeah. And so, and needless to say, she was very pleased. Um, when she saw him uh, before she died, she saw me in Las Vegas at the Trump Canopy. Oh, morning. really? She didn't get uh, to see Yeah, it gives me goosebumps right now because oh, I yeah. love my granny a lot. Yeah. And she liked the idea of having an entertainer uh, in the in family. So, so your, your family is kind of cool with uh, what you've chosen to do then, is that right? Uh, my parents are very <laughs> cool with me. My brother and sister see an opportunity to borrow money. <laughs> So, well, you know, no, it's it's yeah. just turned out very well. Yeah. I, you know, you know. Did, uh, did anything in school prepare you for what you're doing now? Yeah, lack of intelligence. <laughs> uh, I really was. Were you the uh, class clown? I'd like to say I was, but I don't remember being a class clown. Although, if you did get in with me, uh, it would be a battle of wits, uh, verbally. You know, I mean, I don't think it was a class clown, but I was able to protect myself verbally uh, uh -huh. more so than physically at the time. I was rather intimidated uh, by other people. So, yeah, if we got into scuffle, use it as verbal, and then I usually ended up getting my uh, head split open. That's, uh, <laughs> that's how that worked. But you went down with a wisecrack. Sure. <laughs> Well, listen, uh, when, uh, you, you know, you started with the magic, and now you're really getting to be known for the comedy and the stand-up comedy. When did it dawn on you that, that you were more funny than you were mysterious? Well, to do you us? can tell, you can uh, attest to this, that there are a lot more opportunities or venues. I keep using the word opportunity today. You always get hung on a word. Uh, venues, if you can be more versatile, and so many times magic, if, certain type of magic will get you stuck into one area. As far as close-up magic, you know you can only do that in front of so many people. Uh, stage magic, obviously you have to have a stage. Comedy magic, you can do in a, on a platform, basically with just uh, Back somebody the holding a flashlight yeah. or yeah. something like that. Uh, comedy magic, it, it can be done almost anywhere. And I just wanted, uh, you're limited to the amount of money that you can make doing close-up. So mm -hmm. that also hurts you there, as well as on stage, you have to have the big stage. So I think comedy magic for me was the uh, ideal situation because I enjoyed talking. It didn't bother me to talk to people. Yeah. And uh, I think that's kind of uh, what triggered it was just the opportunities were there to yeah. do other things other than just being locked into one magic. Uh, right. Well, thing. just like learning magic tricks behind the bar was an opportunity yeah. and doing comedy magic without physical limitation uh -huh. of your stage or your audience then uh, was a, right. a bigger opportunity. Right. Now, you have an interesting story to tell about Jay Leno and the part, the role that he played in your in your career. Well, you know, it, I hate, you hate dropping names, but uh, I don't mind oh, because drop some, it was... Because uh, Jay may tune in sometime. And it, we'll it, for <laughs> me, uh, it was a turning point, as, as slight as it may have seemed at the time, and when you talk to people in conversation, but... Uh, I was working with him in one of his last uh, club dates in uh, Houston, Texas, a place called The Laugh Stop, and I was a featured act. Uh, I was very lucky. Comedy, magic, variety, uh, entertainment, usually very seldom is used to open a show because it's a little bit stronger. Yeah. So I was put into a middle uh, slot uh, almost immediately. And uh, on Thursday, we were walking down the hallway together. Uh, we came in from the Allen Park Hotel, and uh, he, he just said to me, he said, you know, you don't have to do this magic if you don't want to. You're just a funny guy, and you could tell jokes. And I've, I'd never written jokes. Everything had been magic, and uh, for the most part, it had been kind of straight, but it was funny. You know, it hasn't really developed 
to what it is now, but I mean, it was humorous, yeah. and it, if nothing else, it was interesting to watch. But you were writing your lines for the magic, though. Sure, weren't that you? was yeah. all my own stuff. Sure. Um, I had drawn past the stock lines that you used in the beginning right. to develop confidence, and as you get into your personality, then you develop what it is you want to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he just said, start writing comedy. You could write comedy, and I'd never written any jokes. And so Jay, I, I just said to Jay, I said, I don't even know how to write a joke. He goes, he goes you do, you just don't know how to structure it. And uh, so he took, he went right off of what I did, this is what amazed me, is he, he said, okay, you do magic, right? And I said, yeah, and he goes, okay, he goes, as a kid growing up, my favorite trick was being able to make my peas disappear and reappear on my little brother's plate. <laughs> and I thought that was very funny, that for a magician, that, that's very funny, it's a funny joke. And he, he, he just said it to me walking down the hallway. And so uh, later that night, I came up with a joke. As a kid growing up, I didn't, I didn't like spinach either. And my father would say, Mike, lead all your spinach. Don't you want to grow up to be just like Popeye? Well, even at nine years old, I knew olive oil was a pretty ugly woman. <laughs> and, and that's how the whole thing got started. Yeah. And, and then I would write, like my, my father would say, Mike, lead your spinach. It'll make you regular. Regular? Well, I, I enjoyed being unleaded. What's regular? <laughs> I remember the first time I swallowed a quarter. I wasn't sure if I was going to have change or what. <laughs> My mother said, sweetheart, don't worry. We'll get it when it comes out. I said, hey, mom, you're going to be the only one on that treasure hunt. <laughs> I mean, that's how the whole thing got started. It all just yeah. started to fall together. Yeah. So, obviously, the first, first comedy that I did write was all about my family because it's what I knew the best. Sure. And it, and, and it seems I felt comfortable talking about it because it, it wasn't anything that was hurting anybody. It was all just an experience as a yeah. kid growing up. You know? Yeah. Now, what did your family think when they came to see the act and uh, um, suddenly you're making fun of, uh, fun actually, of your uh, childhood? Um, they were happy because what I was talking about were good memories, were fond memories, were things that I was taught lessons. Yeah. And so it, did, they it didn't necessarily grow out of pain like some comedians. No, no. Uh, uh, like Louis Anderson, if you yeah, know, a lot know, of a lot of no, the mine is all very wrenching. positive. I, I had two parents who loved me very much and uh, worked very hard at you know developing me. And I tell people now, if you see me on stage, if you like what I do, truly, it's my mother, my father's best in ingredients coming through in what I have to say. Mm -hmm. for sure. Well, that's nice because there's not a lot of people today that are no, together enough what, to be. You, you, you know. always hear how bad their parents treated them. Uh, sure, I, I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky, I guess. Well, tell us about your wife, Lori. Now, how long have you been married, and uh, how did you meet her? And uh, <laughs> she's played an important role in your <laughs> life as well. Oh yeah, I think uh, a, a lot of the applause and stuff should go to her. Um, and I won't get too creamy about this, but uh, <laughs> well, we have we've some been music married yet. 14 <laughs> years. Uh, I keep waiting for him to jump in, and he's, he's very polite. You know? I can tell he hasn't worked That's with too many comedians. That's why we keep him around. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And Lori? <laughs> oh, geez. Now that sounds like soap opera. Somebody's <laughs> cheating on somebody here. Um, Lori, it just, she, she uh, was behind me. She, she liked the idea of me doing magic. I think she was amazed, as much amazed as, as I was when I started. And she enjoyed me coming. Uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> she enjoyed me coming home. And Everybody's she, and a comedian. Tricks, yeah. you know, and doing uh -huh. tricks for her. She, she, I don't think she had seen as much magic or less than I had probably. So she was a good uh, stooge, more or less, because she, she knew nothing. If it was good, she said, what happened? Where, where'd it go? And if it wasn't, she said, well, I saw that. You know? yeah. So needless to say, I slept on the couch an awful lot <laughs> in the beginning. But she was very supportive. And uh, finally, when I did make a decision to go into magic f with uh, full-time, she got a part-time job to make sure that the few bills that we had were paid. And, uh, and then she became a part of the act, I, I, you know. You know um, oh, sure, I remember. I got into a dove act. I started doing a dove act. Uh, you had some incredibly trained uh, doves. How <coughs> long did you work with? Uh, well, you know what? Uh, Tom Sony uh, the said, great you just Tom have Sony. To, the great Tom Sony said, you have to just live with your birds. They have to trust you and know what you're doing. So our birds stayed in the house with us. Uh -huh. and, and that can be a real mess, you know that. Oh, yeah. Uh, and obviously you have to train them. They're just like any other animal. You have to train them and, and get them comfortable. And you have to talk to them. They have to know that, that you're there, that who's handling them, because you're, they're working in front of you most of the time, the yeah. birds, you know. So Lori and I handle the birds all the time. Every day you have to handle them, and we got them comfortable uh, to where they would sit on a perch throughout a full show. And this was a, with a lot of... Uh, a, commotion, a lot of yeah. commotion, a lot of kids running around yelling, and then, yeah. and, uh, so I was very fortunate, and I just got a, a, a tip from a professional. A lot of my successes come from professionals taking the time just to say one or two things to me that were going to make a difference. Not trying to overkill, just one or two, right. th two things that would make a difference. Right. And and so you went through this whole act and everything, and Lori was a part of it, and then. Well, see, I'll tell you yeah. what. That and then came the comedy. Went close-up magic. Uh, then I wanted to hit more people, so I went to stage magic. And then working in front of kids, uh, I developed 
the confidence to talk in front of them, so I did comedy magic for them, kids tricks, everything I do on stage now, it amazes me. All the tricks that I do on stage now are the same tricks I did for kids, uh -huh. just a different language, you know? Sure. Um, a little more sophisticated, whatever. Now, are kids intimidated by you? Are they, uh, were they kind of... I think I mean, when, I had, when I used to have the permed haircut and stuff, yeah, I think I was a little <laughs> weird. I think I might have scared them, you know? Yeah. But you go through all these phases trying to go for a look. Now, uh, um, people think, kids think I'm a wrestler or something. So Yeah. You alluded to that in the clip that we saw about the... Yeah. Was that based on a, on a true, true experience? True story. True story. So that, that's... I kind of keep that little moniker thing. Do you there. keep a little notebook uh, with you when things happen during the day no, when you're traveling? No, I don't have a notebook, but I've got thousands of napkins. Napkins. You, you write stuff on napkins. We were in a bar the other night, and I'm writing a bit about the IRS, and uh, I have an uncle that I've never met, but I send him a check every year. Uh, <laughs> this, yeah. and so we wrote this down on a piece of paper. Right. Uh, uh, just scraps of paper. I don't think, I don't know too many guys, I guess the guys that get paid for it, but for myself, I just, if it comes to me, I write it down, and I have it, and then eventually work Do you it force out. yourself to sit down and write? I mean, is that a... I can't. A, a, I can't. I don't you're have not the, disciplined I don't have like the... Yeah, I guess discipline would be one. Uh, the concentration uh, is another one. You have to figure out, first of all, what it is you want to start making jokes about and then do, go from there. My best stuff comes when I'm sitting with my friends at, at, at a coffee table or at a, uh, 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 in, a, in a bar or something or at dinner tables or if I'm driving in my car. Like, say, I have to go to L.A. for three weeks or something. I'll drive over instead of flying. Yeah. So I have my car. So you have, so your car, you have sure. six hours of time to concentrate on something. You know, driving mm -hmm. really is mundane. Uh, out on the freeway, so oh, yeah, yeah. There's, there's my opportunity yeah, to write. Yeah, you put it on autopilot and going you have to LA. A, you, know, you have a mini recorder that you talk into uh -huh. occasionally if it's there. Now, do you tape your act uh, vo you know, on audio tape? Do you tape it so that you I can play it I used to do that in the beginning, and, and really I should still do it now, but I don't, uh, because there are nights when you're inspired and you have an extra line to something that comes out. And when you get off stage, the adrenaline is flowing so much you can't remember what it was you said. Yeah. And so it might have brought the tape house more, down. And, I, yeah. and I suggest that anybody who's learning it uh, tape every chance they get, not only audibly but video, uh, because you look at yourself and you see things like yeah. you shouldn't look in a certain direction, or you're not making enough eye contact. What's and, the, and I have a bad habit of doing that. What's the biggest mistake that most? Because you probably see a lot of amateur comics uh, in the clubs, you know, try open mic night or whatever the guys biggest that get up. Biggest mistake? What's the biggest mistake they make? Saying things that aren't real to them. Uh huh. Not not. Not saying what they truly... In order to get someone to believe what it is you're saying, you have to believe it yourself. And I think a lot of people say things uh, for shock. and uh, They think that a string of four-letter words is going to well, be not, funny. Well, yeah, that too. That can be included too. But just phrasing things that aren't what they really truly believe. I think you have to say something that you believe in order to make people believe it and laugh at so, it. So I guess the, the whole idea is to be yourself but be bigger than life. Is that... Yeah, is project. That, yeah. Project your personality. Project... Uh, Project every every good thing you can. I, I think um, it's amazing to me that uh, so many there's, there's a lot of variety, a lot of different variety of comedies out there. So there's something for everybody. I, I suppose maybe I might be a little narrow when I, I say that, but uh, for the most part, the people that I know, uh, the stuff they talk about is real. It's something they've experienced. I mean, uh, yeah, I think that's what works. Very good. What's your favorite place to play? What, do you have a favorite Vegas. club? Vegas. Without you like a doubt, Vegas. Vegas. Is, that, is it the energy or is it just <coughs> well, the, the people I, you I work with up there? I think it's the energy, there? but you know what? I travel 35, 35 weeks a year. I've averaged for the last eight years in a row out on the road. Mm -hmm. And I'm traveling to Des Moines, Iowa, uh, Houston, Texas, uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Miami, uh, Ohio. I'll be in Chicago next week and then I go to Cleveland. So. I don't have to travel all these places. All these people come to Vegas. Right. But my experience in traveling to all those places, I know when they come to Vegas, I'm going to make them have a really good time because I yeah. made them laugh out there. Right. Hey, listen, speaking of uh, places you're going to play, uh, uh, you, you are going to be seen here locally in the Phoenix area. And I know you have a lot of fans in the Phoenix area that uh, like to come out and see you and support Variety Arts, as we ask everybody to do every week. If we could show that graphic, uh, this is Michael Finney will be appearing November 23rd through the 29th at the Last Laugh. Comedy Club. That's located at uh, I-17 and Northern Avenue. Is that it's great right? Club. It's a great yeah. club. I worked. Uh, it's a nice place. They have a couple of them. I worked at the one in San Jose, and I'm going up to the one in Seattle. I am doing another date, uh, July the 12th, at the Improv. I'm filling in for a guy uh -huh. that uh, needs to cut out on this the night. show. May be seen after that date. So well, then it, you will have missed that July. If you 12th missed it, date. it was a great show. <laughs> What, tell us real quick about the being on Star Search, because we only probably have a couple minutes left here. Star Search was great. I, I wished I would have done magic on there. Uh -huh. uh, I should have done did magic. Did they discourage that? Because, you know... No, I never even asked to do it. I just felt that when I went on there, I should compete as a comedian. 
Uh, and then when, they, when I got beat by a guy playing guitar, that, that kind of, uh, I, I guessed wrong. Yeah. Because I think if you're going on there and you're going to do comedy for two minutes, it should just be a comedy act. I don't think a comedian should have to deal or go up against a guy playing a guitar because that's a musician. Or a juggler doing, or a comedy, exactly. comedian doing uh, juggling. Have, have, you know, if, you're, if you're a variety act, have that competition. If you're a comedian, it, ha it should be straight. Standard. Have they ever so, thought about doing a variety arts competition? Because, I mean, you know, they used to do the acting thing when it first started. They sure, had people yeah. who came on and acted with stars and they got I have that. no idea. I have no idea. The experience was great. It was three appearances on, four, four appearances on television. Um, Ed McMahon was a prince. He was a real nice guy. The people that worked there were very nice. I just, just that one little incident there, yeah. I just, uh, yeah. a bad taste in my mouth for that. Yeah. Did you make a little, uh... They pay you. They pay you scale payment. Yeah. And, uh, they don't, they used to pay you if you, you, know, you in the beginning, you used to pay a thousand if you wanted, and a thousand for going on to the next show, but they don't, they didn't do that. They yeah. did just, it, e economically, I think it must have got kind of tough. But it probably did a lot of good for you in terms of visibility and Visibility uh, and contacts. exposure yeah. and going to the semifinals was real good, and yes, it did bring up my comedy club money yeah. and, and propel me right into a full headlining status, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was great. Yeah. Uh, what's, I, the, what's the worst part of traveling on the road? Every comedian's got their worst. I think, uh, I think uh, most of the time it's just the accommodations. If we stay in hotels, that's, that's pretty cool, but curtains never close all the way. Um, <laughs> the maids, the maids knocking in the, with the do not disturb sign, that's kind of a drag. Uh, I think that's just it, just, just not sleeping in your you own ever, bed. You ever, put the, uh, you ever put the sanitized for your protection strip back around the toilet? No, that's I've never good, done that. Yeah, do that for like three, four days in a row, and pretty soon the ma maids will look at you real funny. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they'll understand why you're upset, you're just irregular. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, uh, we've had so much fun with you that, and I haven't had a chance to ask you even half the stuff that I wanted to. Would you be nice enough to come back and join us again for another uh, appearance? Boy, if you've got film, I'll do it for you. <laughs> oh, listen, we got videotape. Uh, that's uh, that's not the problem. Uh, we want you to come back and join us again so that uh, we can talk a little bit more about the magic and the comedy because we really didn't talk about. Uh, uh, most people wonder how jokes are put together and and how they're structured. And Jay Leno. Obviously, uh, that was the comment. He said, you know how to write jokes, but you just don't know how to structure it. So maybe right. we'll talk about that and a little bit more about the magic scene here, uh, here and around the country. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Sure, anytime. And uh, uh, we'll hope to see you at uh, The Last Laugh. Yeah, definitely. definitely November 23rd through the 29th. Yeah, is that right? Thanksgiving. Yeah, that's a Thanksgiving week. Yeah, it'd be a nice At the last laugh. Out. All right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you, Van Corten, for being here again this week. Remember, support Variety Arts in your community. Bye-bye, everybody. We're out of here. <laughs>